Richard and I have been working on the impact of inequality for a long time. Um, we are epidemiologists, yeah, sorry it's such a difficult word to say, but you know, epidemiologists study the distribution and determinants of health and disease in populations. Um, we're social epidemiologists, so we've always been interested in the social determinants of health. And we both became interested in the impact of inequality on health quite a long time ago. One of us rather longer ago than the other. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Me, the mid-1970s, I'm afraid. <laughs> he was very much ahead of his time. Um, we worked on, on, on this in an academic way, you know, for a long time, publishing journal articles, you know, peer-reviewed journal articles, um, showing that income inequality was linked to health and some other problems. But the difficulty with, um, well, well, one of the issues with that kind of journal article is that nobody reads it, okay? <laughs> nobody ever reads those sorts of articles. And we felt that we were sitting on a large body of evidence that needed to be better known, that was important for policymakers and politicians to know. So we decided to write the spirit level together to try and get the research on inequality out into the public domain. And in a sense, it felt like my last attempt as I retired to get these issues onto the public agenda. I'd written about them several times before, um, but wasn't really read more uh, amongst people outside our own academic field. So we wrote the spirit level with a very um, um, sharp purpose. You know, we really wanted to reach a wider public. So we made lots of decisions about how we presented the research and the graphs. We tried to write in an accessible way. We filled the book with stories and cartoons as well as graphs, knowing that most people don't love a graph. Um, and what we showed in that book was that inequality is linked to poor health in society, everything from life expectancy to obesity, mental illness, infant mortality. We showed that inequality is linked to children's life chances, so things like teenage pregnancy, social mobility, how well kids do in school. And we showed that inequality is linked to the relationships between us all in our different societies, levels of trust and violence and imprisonment. So we showed that this was true both for rich developed countries, the more unequal countries had more problems, but also for the 50 US states, we showed that your more unequal states had more health and social problems than your more equal states. We also were showing that those differences were pretty large. So we weren't just talking about small differences between US states or small differences between the USA and, say, the Scandinavian countries. The differences were large as many as eight times as many teenage pregnancies in more unequal countries compared to equal ones, 12 times the rate of imprisonment, three times the rate of mental illness. That's because it's not only the poor who are affected by inequality, we're all affected. And we have colleagues at Harvard who describe inequality as a social pollutant. They say it's like air pollution. You can't get away from it in society just as you can't get away from air pollution. You can't barricade yourself away and hide yourself and not be exposed to inequality. So lots of different impacts, big impacts, and we're all affected. And those are the basic messages um, in the spirit level. So in the approximately decade since, there's been an explosion of new research on inequality all over the world from lots of different researchers in different disciplines and in our new book we're, we're summarizing some of that um, but also we've had a decade to ponder those relationships and try to dig beneath the statistics that we were showing in the spirit level and really come to a better understanding of how it is that income inequality exerts a grip on us and creates these levels of distress disease and disunity in our different societies. So I thought I would read um, just a short passage from our new book, um, The Inner Level, and then Richard will talk a little bit more about the new book. 
the detail of the, of the content. So this is from chapter five. Larger income gaps make normal social interaction increasingly fraught with anxiety and stimulate three kinds of response. Some people are overcome by low self-esteem, lack of confidence, and depression. Others become increasingly narcissistic and deploy various forms of self-aggrandizement to bolster their position in others' eyes. But because both are responses to increased anxiety, everyone becomes more likely to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol and falls prey to consumerism to improve their self-presentation. As social life becomes more of an ordeal and a performance, people withdraw from social contact and community life weakens. Crucially, we have seen that the bigger the income differences between rich and poor, the worse all of this gets. We treat our shyness, self-doubt, and frequent inability to feel at ease with others as if they were purely personal psychological weaknesses, as if they were flaws built into our emotional makeup that we must co cope with on our own as best we can. Because we tend to hide these insecurities from each other, we fail to see them in others. But surveys suggest that they are so widespread but f that few but the most confident escape them. So really what we're saying about inequality is it raises the importance of status between us. Bigger material differences between us lead to bigger social distances between us. We, you know, we all have a pretty nasty way of judging each other's worth by their position in the hierarchy, you know, judgments of whether they're capable and intelligent or yeah, all those kinds of things. All that seems to increase with more inequality. Um, status becomes the measure of a person. Um, and that means as we judge others more by status that we fear more how we are judged by status. Uh, and that feeds into and exacerbates a lot of the insecurities about personal wealth, how we're seen and judged by others. And uh, amongst the new research that um, Kate mentioned um, is, for instance, research which shows uh, that in all income groups, people in more unequal countries are more worried about status, higher levels of status anxiety um, about these judgments. Um, and that reminds me in a way that one of the things that made us keen to do this book is I think that a lot of people think that things to do with inequality are all sort of out there in society. They don't really matter to me in my personal life, my family, my friends, my um, little emotional ups and downs and so on. Uh, it's not part of the private sphere. In a sense, we're trying to show that Inequality is deeply important to the private sphere. It almost defines what success and failure is. Um, if you say somebody's done well, you mean they've moved up, they've made money. Uh, and all that kind of thing becomes stronger. Um, and money becomes more the measure of people. So people work longer hours. Uh, it pushes up consumerism. If you live in a more unequal area, you're more likely to spend money on um, status goods and um, a flashy car and so on. Studies that... Uh, and what's, what's important is we, the things we're saying we're now able to demonstrate with data comparing more and less equal countries. So you can actually see that these things are going on. It's not just a sort of personal hunch. But before I finish, these worries about um, status and how you're seen lead to two rather different responses. <coughs> One is that uh, you're overcome by low self-esteem, lack of confidence, uh, feelings perhaps of inferiority, you start to find social contact um, quite an ordeal, you know, very stressful because of these worries to do with self-worth you start to withdraw from social life. 
But the other response <coughs> that I think is, is perhaps even more common is almost the opposite. These insecurities lead you endlessly to try and show your personal worth to other people. Um, and so narcissism goes up. Uh, and Trump is a nice example of perhaps of some of the characteristics that are more common in more unequal societies. Um, uh, there's a nice measure uh, in different countries of self-enhancement where you, uh, people are asked in different countries, how do you think you compare with the average for your country? Do you think you're more intelligent than most Americans? Do you think you're more attractive than most Americans? Um, and uh, the famous joke, uh, apparently 90% of the population think they're better drivers than average. <laughs> um, so we trace through these forms of self-enhancement um, and it goes through to a, a quite nasty um, extent and I'm just going to read, not sure I can remember where this reading stops, no, uh, if I, it doesn't matter if I go too far. <laughs> okay. All societies like to think of themselves as ones in which honest, law-abiding, hard-working citizens can make a living, contribute to society and find fulfilment. We expect our institutions, whether schools, businesses or governments, to reward moral, ethical behavior, hard work and cooperation. However, inequality and the heightened status competition and individualism which go with, with it seem to contribute to a culture in which good, greed is good, risk-taking is admired and the differences between overly dominant behavior and leadership are lighted. In such a climate, it's perhaps no wonder uh, that individuals with a personality disorder characterized by lying, manipulation, deceit, egocentricity and callousness can often be found at the very top of, the modern, of modern corporate structures. Greater inequality not only causes uh, psychopathic tendencies to manifest in more people, it provides the cutthroat environment in which those tendencies come to be seen as admirable and valuable and competitiveness as more important than cooperation. I think that may be where we thought we'd end. Uh, but that's just, in a way, that's just the first section of the book. We go on to look at the, uh, the kind of justifications uh, that are used to sustain inequality. The idea that the social pyramid uh, is uh, a pyramid of uh, in, in innate differences in ability. And that's really not a view that can be sustained. Now we know more about the malleability of the human mind and the effects of the kind of environment you're in and uh, what you do, which really shapes our brains. Um, we also look at the idea that uh, inequality is, is just a direct expression of uh, human competitiveness, self-interestedness, and so on. Um, we look at the anthropology that shows that uh, for 90% of our existence as modern, uh, anatomically modern human beings, we lived in remarkably egalitarian societies. Um, so we go through these sorts of things um, uh, 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 and show in a way that there are two rather contrasting versions of human nature. One, the caring, sharing human nature in which, you know, we can deal with our friends, we can make friends, we know how to cooperate, gain people's trust and, and work with other people. And the other, to do with dominance and hierarchy where we try and build ourselves up and put other people down. Um, those both have deep evolutionary roots um, and we use both of them all the time, uh, but the balance between them seems to be affected very strongly by the degree of inequality in society that transforms social relationships from ones where community life is strong, a lot of reciprocity, to at the extremes, places like South Africa and Mexico, where you see people are frightened of each other. The houses are barricaded with fences and, and the bars on doors and windows and so on. Um, and you're advised not to go out at night. 
And that transformation in the quality of human relationships is closely related to inequality. So we thought um, we'd stop there and um, just open it up for discussion with all of you. So please ask us anything you'd like. Sure. Do you see, I haven't read your book yet, um, do you see correlation or, or a relationship between uh, economic inequality and the various isms, racism, sexism, on and on, all the isms, do you see a relationship or a correlation between them? With what? With racism, sexism, and all okay. the other ways in which, which people are... Do you are want to do that? Or shall you I? actually, in my understanding of what you're saying, you've just implied what I'm asking about. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, basically, um, anything that marks people out as different or anything that, that can be um, seen as, as a marker of lower social status, and that's going to differ from society to society. <laughs> So in some it might be race, in others it might be um, language or religious grouping. Um, gender is clearly important here, as are various kinds of abilities, disabilities. But anything that attracts stigma or downward prejudice or you know, becomes a marker of lower social class, everything that goes along with that is going to be worse in a more unequal society. You know, when, when, when the differences between us, the distance, social distances between us, get larger, then that downward pressure, I think, becomes even more um, exacerbated. And, you know, these different markers of low social status, uh, they really do attract the same kind of stigma. In a sense, what we're talking about is the extent to which people are valued. Um, yeah. It's not only about income inequality, it's about number of friends you have and all sorts of things. But also, of course, it's about solidarity and, and con social connections. And so, I'll come to him, but um, one of my students just um, found that in more unequal countries, people are less willing to talk to somebody with a mental illness. So there's more of that distancing, less, less of that neighborliness, empathy, across social divides and across various um, groupings and, and ways in which we're divided. Yeah. yeah. Okay, in countries and in states that are equal and those that are unequal, has there been any changes through the years? Are some countries or states becoming more unequal and others mm -hmm. becoming uh, yes. more equal? Yes. And which states and which countries yeah. are changing? There have been long-term changes in inequality, I and mean, through the 20th century, uh, you saw a long decline in inequality in most developed countries. So inequality was high until about 1930, and then it began a downward trend that continued right through until the late 1970s. And then you had the modern rise of inequality, taking us back to levels of inequality and hierarchy that we last saw in the 1920s. It's bigger in some countries than others, it's bigger in the United States in, and in Britain, smaller in the Scandinavian countries, in France and the Netherlands as well, um, and the, diff the experience of different American states where we also test out these relationships. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of variation there. Can I come in on that? Um, couple of, a couple of sort of interesting examples of that. One is the contrast between Japan and the United States. So if we looked at both countries just after World War II, Japan was much, much more unequal. And the USA was a much more equal place than it is now. And if, if at that time we'd looked at how well those different countries were doing in terms of health, the United States was quite high up the rankings of life expectancy among different countries, and Japan was low down. But since then, they've swapped places. So Japan has become much more equal and now has the longest life expectancy in the world. And the USA has become much more relatively unequal and has seen its health drop in comparison to, to other countries. And recently, um, we've been looking at changes in children's well-being over time. And the country within the um, rich developed market democracies that's been most rapidly becoming unequal is Sweden. 
So it's got the fastest growing inequality among the OECD countries, and we've seen its child well-being decline just as we would anticipate. Do we know why? Do we know why it's become more unequal? Change of government. Politics. Mm. Um, and where we can see the impact of it most clearly is among children and young people and in levels of mental well-being. Yes. Different countries have political parties, some of which believe that there's too much inequality and some of which seem to believe that inequality is better because it motivates people to work and the people that work will become rich and those that are lazy won't. Um, do you look at what um, the philosophy of pe what people believe about inequality politically? Or we, look at, we look less at what they believe than what is actually happening. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's very clear that lots of people think you need inequality to stimulate creativity, initiative, uh, uh, people trying to get up and so on. Um, we were challenged with that by a conservative politician in Britain who had been part of uh, Mrs Thatcher's government. And uh, when talking about it afterwards, we thought, OK, a good test of this would be to see how many patents per head of population there are. You know, when people invent things, they often patent them. Um, and uh, we found uh, in the data we looked at that there were marginally more patents per head of population in the more equal countries. But since then, there's been a much bigger analysis that shows really quite a strong tend, tendency for more equal countries to be more innovative, uh, more inventive. <coughs> and now, um, if you look at um, uh, more broadly, I mean, uh, a lot of the international organizations like OECD and the World Bank the International Monetary Fund have all been changing their tune on inequality and saying that actually inequality is bad for growth. It leads to less sustained growth, more ups and downs. Um, and, you know, we look at our data and we see that there are more people um, taking drugs, there are more people in prison, there's lower social mobility, uh, and children's maths and literacy scores are lower in the more unequal countries. And so it looks to us as if more unequal societies are wasting a lot of their talent, basically. I just want to add one thing to that, and I think it is a very common idea on the right that people at the bottom of society are lazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And it is just so wrong. You know, it is really hard work to be poor. Yeah. You, have to, you have to manage life so much more carefully mm -hmm. when you are poorer. You, you have to be on top of things. You have to be organized. Um, and there's, a, there's an economist at the University of Cambridge called Harjun Chang, and he writes about how hard people work in low-paid jobs, you know, and so this this myth that people at the bottom of society are lazy and shirking, we need to fight that one all we can whenever we meet it. But it is a very widely promulgated view, especially in our in our media. So another myth that I have experienced, and is um, the myth that societies in general need to just continue to grow. Right? The consumerism, like mm -hmm. like you just said, it's all, you know, the, the International Monetary Fund is like uh, uh, that inequality is bad for growth. I mean, that's assuming that growth is a good thing, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, <coughs> do you guys speak to that? Yes. Um, we the, the last two chapters about how you combine greater equality um, with the move towards sustainability. In fact, we think of greater equality as, in, in a way, a precondition to moving towards sustainability. The and that's recognizing. Is that what you're yeah. Saying? yeah. And yeah. that's recognizing that we can't afford to continue to grow forever. You know, right. we live on a finite planet. There are limits to, right. to growth. Mm -hmm. It's not just that we can't afford to, but in the rich countries, further economic growth is no longer driving the real improvements in human well-being. Right. 
happiness and measures of well-being have stalled. Although, um, actually, your health improvements have stalled too, but um, uh, in most countries where there continue to be rises in life expectancy, they now seem unrelated to economic growth. Um, and so economic growth is what's transformed the quality of our lives, but it's done its work. Uh, you know, in poorer countries, having more of necessities is really important. But for having us having more and more of everything makes less and less difference. Right. So in a way, I think our work has something very hopeful to enter into that post-GDP debate, right? So all over the world, people are talking about alternative economic structures, what are we going to do instead of pursuing economic growth because we've got to do something differently. Um, and clearly, what we need is growth in well-being. So our work kind of speaks to that, but also makes it clear that inequality is in itself a barrier towards moving towards sustainability. Yep. But if we could become more equal, it's a win-win. Not only will we be more able to deal with those threats of climate change, etc., but we will actually have a better quality of life. And you do hear that there's conversations about this around the world? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Lots of conversations. So the challenge at the moment is joining them all up. Mm -hmm. Right, so there are Nobel Prize winning economists working on this, there are um, environmental activist groups, there are people concerned about global health. We just need to get all of those movements and all of those groupings working, working together in a unified way. Not easy, but possible. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you're familiar with a local uh, self-described plutocrat by the name of Nick Hanauer and he had an article in the Seattle Times recently and you can see him on YouTube he was speaking about the pitchforks coming and he essentially my question is do you see room for the capitalistic system to continue at the same time as this equality that you're referring to which I, I'm on your side but we obviously the, the struggle is against the system of this, frankly, capitalistic system. I'm wondering, is some capitalism possible? And Nick Hanauer speaks to that. And he's basically saying, hey, we need to let everyone else come on up also, which kind of sort of is agreeing with what you're saying. My question is, first of all, do you know this person? Have you heard of what he's talking about? And then secondarily, do you think uh, it, it, it would work? I haven't heard of him. Um, but um, I, I usually, when asked about capitalism, particularly in sustainability, I give two almost opposite answers. And one answer is to say that all the countries we've compared are basically capitalist, uh, whether it's uh, the Scandinavian countries or the United States. There are differences in the extent of market intervention, uh, differences in the size of the public sector, but they're both they're all market societies with class hierarchies and so on. Um, I think it's a very important difference um, between the way those societies operate. I don't think there's any doubt at all that the Scandinavian model produces higher levels of well-being and, and longer lives and so on. Um, but when you think about sustainability, it seems to me that to start off from a society in which, you know, everything is pushing us towards maximizing our consumption, you know, we all want higher incomes because, that, you know, that's what success is about almost. Um, and uh, at the same time, all businesses is want, uh, wanting to maximize sales and profits. And, you know, those two are locked together, and uh, uh, that's the market that runs our societies. Uh, and advertising uh, sort of greases the wheels of that system, making us want to buy more to improve our status and so on. 
Uh, and as I said, uh, there are now lots of studies that show that our worries about status lead, leading to more status competition uh, uh, drive and exacerbate that consumerism. Um, so I think we're starting from an awful place. And when people ask me about, you know, can we do it with capitalism, that seems to me the crunch of the problem. Uh, we can make nicer societies, but maybe even the Scandinavians are not going to be able to deal with climate, climate change. I'm curious about the role of um, institutions, that, especially those that serve children and young people, in terms of uh, my, one of my theories for the last 10 or more years since I became aware of your work was that um, the major reason um, for the level of inequality in our county, which is the biggest, as I'm sure you know, in the entire nation, is because we have the highest percentage of private school enrolled kids here in this area. And that the society that I grew up in, in this very same city, was radically different than what children are experiencing now when we didn't even know the names of the private schools, there was no question that we would not go to public schools, and it was less than 5%. Today it's in the high teens, I believe, of private school enrolled children, which is the highest of any city in the entire nation. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm curious about that. Yeah. That's right. We produce inequality very effectively. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Reproduce. So educational systems can clearly be an engine that um, perpetuates, entrenches, and reinforces inequality. Mm -hmm. But educational systems can also be systems that help to level yes. the playing field. You know, obviously it depends very much on, on how they're structured. Um, I, I think our society, as well as yours, you know, the elites at the top are dominated by the privately educated. Um, and I think we expect too much of our schools as well if we expect them to overcome all the effects of inequality that are not being addressed elsewhere. So not only do we sort of um, have this two-tier or, or um, inequality generating system, but then for our teachers who are trying to do their best within the public school system, they're fighting a losing battle is too much yes. to overcome. Um, other countries do do it differently. Finland notably got rid of all of its private education, up the status of its school teachers and saw its, saw its average performances rise. Sweden, which I mentioned before, is seeing a decline in its child well-being, um, has also been reforming its education system in a negative way. And I saw a report come out, I think it was in... I think it was 2016 from the OECD, a report on Sweden's education system. And it was the most sort of hard hitting, um, finger wagging report I've ever seen from the OECD. It basically said, Sweden, stop doing this. You know, your children are suffering, your educational performance is declining because of what you've done to your school system, allowing, um, you, know, you know, more segregation, more elitism. So, I mean, I think, I think your point is. Yeah. It's well made. And I, every, I think everyone knows that home background is such a strong determinant of educational success. Um, and the performance of schools seems so closely related to the poverty or wealth of <coughs> catchment area. Um, and the rise in inequalities since around 1980 uh, internationally was not a change in educational systems. So I think people often hope that it, education reform can deal with inequality, but it wasn't what created the modern rise of inequality. Good question uh, I wanted to ask if anybody has been doing research looking at the rate of deunionization. Uh -huh. And because, of course, unions are one way in which solidarity is expressed and often attacked, certainly in this country, um, and have been in decline since the 70s. And we also have seen the, the rise in inequality going up in that same 
at, at the same time as, as the de deunionization. So, and I, I just wondered if anybody's lo looking at that particularly yet. Do you want to? Well, we've seen for at least half a dozen countries uh, the graph of declining inequalities, as I said, from sometime in the 1930s going right through till the late 1970s and then the modern rise of inequality, uh, the graphs I'm talking about show also the proportion of the population in the working population in trade unions, and it's exactly the opposite. And so we think that long-term decline and then rise of inequality uh, is about the strength of the whole labor movement, uh, probably the fear of communism, the strength of social democratic parties, the strength of the what we sometimes call the countervailing voice in the media. People um, included in these chat shows on television and writing columns in the newspapers who have another idea of how society can be better for all of us. Um, and ideally, people who are backed up by research departments, as trade union leaders uh, often are. Actually, in the US, the labor reporters <coughs> basically got rid of from all the major newspapers at least two decades ago. So that hasn't exactly helped to get um, any kind of media coverage of Labor. That's right. I think that's right. <coughs> I mean, in, in the UK, we are seeing a bit of a resurgence um, in union membership. And, and in particular, I think what, what has struck me are unions trying to reach out to workers in very precarious mm -hmm. sectors now um, and encourage them to unionize so that they can um, fight, fight for rights mm -hmm. which they don't have. Fast food workers, um, care workers, catering, those industries. I was invited recently to speak in Stockholm um, by a trade union organization and uh, afterwards I was taken to a nice restaurant and I was astonished that uh, all the restaurant staff were uni unionized, not something you'd find in Britain. No. You mentioned that Japan and the United States were on opposite paths. Do you, have you seen other paths uh, either toward or away from uh, equalization that you have outlined in the book? Sorry, no. uh, yeah, so, so uh, the trajectories you. that different countries are following. I mean, it's really sad, actually, if you look over the, over the last sort of century. Most countries followed the same pattern. Mm -hmm. As, as us, you know, they became more equal through the 20th century and then they followed the neoliberal ideology and all became much more unequal again. There are some places that buck the trend a bit. Um, countries in Latin America are becoming more equal, more rapidly than most other regions of the world, although I'm, that's grinding to a halt in some of them and starting to reverse in, in, in some of them. Um, Trends aren't great everywhere. You know, the most that we seem to be seeing our countries sort of managing to hold the line but somewhat. I think why it's worth fighting these battles at an ideological level is that it does look as if uh, the change in inequality is a change in international ideology. And it's very interesting that you can see these different ideological patterns sweeping the world. I mean, the, the 1960s was a radical decade everywhere, not just here. Uh, the, 1940, the 1848 revolutions sprung up on different continents. Um, and it, it's hard to understand quite how it is these, these international ideological trends sweep the world. But it's one of the few things that makes me feel maybe it is worth going on fighting it in terms of arguments, data, statistics. You know, often I feel actually the only thing that makes any difference is a riot. <laughs> Do you find New Zealand hopeful? Do I find New Zealand hopeful? Yes, at the moment, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so. Um, when we were doing our analysis in our previous book, New Zealand's one of the more unequal of the rich developed countries. Um, 
now they've got a young, dynamic female prime minister who takes inequality really seriously. So I think, yes, I feel hopeful about New Zealand. I was pretty delighted that they decided on giving personhood to one of the big rivers on the North Island. Yeah, the yeah, right. yeah. And it seemed so appropriate Yeah. we give personhood to Sure, to corporations, corporations. why not a river? To a river. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And I think, I think another thing that, that we have personally noted about New Zealand, we were invited to give a series of lectures in New Zealand, and they have deep ethnic divisions and inequalities in New Zealand, but they're working pretty hard to try and overcome them, and there is certainly a greater climate of respect for their ethnic minorities than you find, say, in Australia with respect to the Aboriginal population there and in other places. And so at any public meeting, um, a Maori greeting will be given as, as well as one in English. And the, yeah, deep, deep divisions and inequalities to overcome, but very much a sense that New Zealand's moving perhaps in the right direction at the moment. Um. I have a question, maybe it's just like I need to say this because there are people here that will Say it loudly. Say it loudly. I said, I don't really have a question, but when you're saying that what gives you hope is, you know, to keep this focus on, on changing international ideology and then you jokingly say sometimes I feel like the only thing that will make a difference is a riot. Like, I'm like, I can sit right next to you in your tent in the belief of that. Um, but the, it's like, I, I would imagine you guys speak to this because you're speaking to it now. And that is, is like these changes have to occur in each person's heart. You know, I, I'm not a parent and yet I work with people all day long that, that are parents. And there's this, there's this innate desire that parents have for their kids, right? Like they want their kids to have a better life than they have. And yet that inherently in itself sort of feeds into this consumerism idea. I'm not saying that the kid should have a worse life than the parents, but that there's just there's this inherent thing that we all have that that and especially I just think it is fed with parents sort of wanting their kids to be you're shaking your head. You must be in education too. Can I, but can I bring there's I don't know, there's something <coughs> in that that there's Yeah, so so there's something in what you say. So you know, parents do tend to love their children, right? And want, and, the, want them to. and want the best for them. And that's fine, and that's good. But what we need to recognize more is how much we need to care for other people's children, yes. as well as our own, yes. right? And that that is just as important. And so that means that, sure, you'll be doing your best for your kids, and, um, and maybe you can afford to buy them things that other parents can't. But that sh doesn't mean you shouldn't be voting for the parties that will do the best for everybody else's children. So we need to balance our sort of innate protectiveness for our own children and wish for them to be safe and happy with a sense of responsibility to, towards other people's but children. Our thinking about our children and grandchildren, it seems to me it's issues of climate change that dominate that picture. I'm afraid I believe that uh, these things are so serious uh, that we're going to be facing, well, a lot of social disorder. Um, there are going to be major breakdowns. I think we're going to get three or four degrees of global warming. Uh, huge flows of refugees from places where it's now impossible, where it becomes impossible to live. And there have been several reports that say already global warming is killing several hundred thousand a year. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, you know, the floods, heat waves, <coughs> droughts and so on that we're going to have to deal with, um, I think they'll be extremely challenging. Um, and so, if we're thinking about our own children, it's not thinking about consumerism and stuff that's the point. It's thinking about how we deal with climate change. Um, One more thing about children, though, and young people, because I think 
that's quite a pessimistic view mm-hmm. coming out. So I wanted to it insert may be a truthful view. It may, yeah. it may, but I want to insert a note of optimism. Um, and what makes me optimistic are our young people, actually. So we look at the voting patterns and the ideologies and the, um, the thoughts among our young people. They're very progressive. They're beginning to realise how serious mm-hmm. these problems um, are. And they don't seem to be getting less progressive as they get a bit older, mm-hmm. like previous <laughs> generations. So I have a lot of hope based, based on our young people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who, who in your country voted for Brexit? Sorry? Yeah. Who, who voted for Brexit? Who voted for Brexit? Yes, it was uh, the two, elderly. Two groups. Partly the people most ground down in the poorest areas, I and mean, the same thing as who voted for Trump here, but also an opposite group, older white people who are in affluent rural areas um, who uh, showed most racism in a sense that they were most worried about immigration, although the fewest immigrants in the areas where they were living. Those two groups, really. We're told that if we had our Brexit vote again today, the result would be different simply because some older people have died and and, and young people have crossed the 18-year-old threshold to vote. But just that demographic trend in the two years since that vote, we would have a different result. Yeah, not because they're not. You had a question. My question has to do with your own well-being. You guys. Don't worry. <laughs> in the sense of the spirit level is clearly an incredibly impactful work. And uh, I'm just curious about how, how, how you gauge that impact and what that kind of meant for you as individuals in the project. We've both group. become terrible narcissists. <laughs> <laughs> and you want um, more money. <laughs> Specifically, like, are, are there some examples or stories about, I mean, impact behind intellectual curiosity, yeah. like how organizations, movements, people have been impacted by that? I, I think it's impossible to tell. I mean, our Spirit Love book was much more successful in other countries than here. Um, <laughs> And we don't really know whether that was an expression of the rise of interest in inequality uh, since the financial crash and with the Occupy movement that really raised attention to inequality, uh, or whether we contributed to that rise of concern with inequality. And there must have been both. Uh, but you can't tell which at well, all. But we do get emails from people quite regularly saying, uh, your book completely changed the way I think about things, something like that. Nice. Uh, yes, it is, I, I spend most of my time sitting alone in front of a computer. Kate goes to, <laughs> off to all her friends at the university. Um, we see, uh, yeah. So, uh, and uh, I, I need those little <laughs> things to make me feel. Oh well, maybe it's worth going on. So, but but here, here here is the difference about having a job. I have to track the impact of our research for my university. Oh. Um, because of a national exercise that happens in the UK that allocates research money to universities. We have to track the impact of the research that we do. So I do spend quite a lot of time trying to figure out if, if our work has had an impact. And it's not enough to just say it has. <laughs> right? You have to be able to give evidence that it has. So I look for things like whether or not our work has been cited in parliamentary debates mm-hmm. and then laws passed. Mm-hmm. So for instance, our work was cited in the House of Commons and the House of Lords when the UK was passing its its last Equality Act in 2010. So I look for impacts like that. Changes in the public discourse, um, citations in policy documents, you know, all of those sorts of things. So it's, It's been cited in the Canadian Parliament and the New Zealand Parliament as well, I think. Yeah, and so um, our work's had an influence on organisations like the OECD, um, like the European Union. Um, we campaigned to have equality reduction as one of the goals within the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and it is. And Richard was one of two experts asked to review those targets. So, so we, we do work to kind of track 
Talk those about impacts. This, your sustainable equality report. Well, that's just an EU commission. Never mind. <laughs> well, how many languages was, was Spirit Level? Spirit Level has been published in 26 languages. Oh, wow. That's influence too. And um, this, this one so far in eight. Um, but it's only been out it's for only been out. a month here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But the personal toll or the, the, the personal impact has also been profound. And I think for Richard, it's been mostly positive. Um, he'd been, you know, Richard's been working on these issues for a long time and now has, has traction and people are listening. He's able to communicate his ideas and his deep thinking. And so really, I think that's, that's been a wonderful thing at this point in his career, to be able to have that platform and to be able to, to be heard. Yes, normally retirement is the beginning of a long, slow decline. <laughs> With me, it's been. <coughs> I have found it much more stressful than Richard, I think. Mm -hmm. um, in part, when our work was criticised, I, I panic, had anxiety and panic attacks about had I got the data wrong, you know, had I made a mistake. I found, I found that exposure really, really worrying. I don't like it when there are internet trolls saying horrible things about me. Um, I don't like that. I find it. I find public speaking excruciatingly stressful. So right now I'm. I'm not the happiest to campus. Sitting here, like smile on my face. So, so I, I find it much, much harder than Richard did. Um, but we, you know, we're in it together. So that helps, doesn't I've it? I've had <laughs> decades of uh, public criticism yes, before he's used to Kate it. joined me. <laughs> I, I never had any of that until I started hanging out with him. <laughs> A kiss of death. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, it's really impressive. Um, yeah, I've seen people um, commented to do English and, and Speak I'm loudly, I am very deaf. And yes, like I said, it's really yes. impressive and admiring seeing, seeing people commenting their research and their work and addressing an important issue like inequality. Um, so I was just inquiring, uh, what is the relation uh, between your work and the uh, bottom of the pyramid concept? By From the bottom seeking, of? The bottom of the pyramid concept. By CK Parahala, as you were saying earlier, like um, you look at the the, 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 the bottom most poorest um, communities, like if you look at all over the world, there is a huge population, like four billion people there. So at the if bottom. market approaches, you know how to strategize to get into those um, um, huge population and they can make profit just as the yeah. way that they are making profit in African societies. So cool. just to try to address this issue of inequality. Is that about international differences? Well, and I think about globalization as can, well. Can you repeat it? Yeah. Because so, I mean, yeah, like, uh, like, like, like... No, go ahead, go, go ahead. Uh, like I was uh, inquiring, uh, is there research related to the bottom of the pyramid concept by C.K. Parahala? Um, the concept of the bottom of the pyramid is like those at the bottom um, economic ladder. Of Some of like us people who live on like basically less than two dollars a day. Mm -hmm. But you look at their population, like four billion in this world. Um, if um, businesses or corporations know how to strategize their market, yes. to be able to penetrate that huge population of four billion, they will be able to make um, 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 profit just like the way they're making profit in affluent communities. Yeah. And, and I think that too is trying to address this issue of inequality. So I was saying yeah. the relationship. Yeah, I think there are real resonances between the, those two approaches. And of course, so often when um, big multinational corporations goes after, um, tries to extract wealth from the poor, it is often through selling them things that either they don't need or are actually actively bad for them. Um, you know, and so some of, some of the biggest um, damaging if impacts on public health come from corporations selling us tobacco, selling us alcohol, selling us guns. The rise of obesity in poorer, poorer countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think I think these these approaches, yeah, they overlap. Do you respond in the new 
look to some of the criticism in the previous in the, uh, previous book. For example, I saw one crit criticism that America is such an outlier that if you removed America. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, do you know what? Do you know what? We, some people say, oh, yeah, America's an outlier. You can take America off, you still get all of those relationships, right? And of course, we show all the relationships we're interested in across the 50 United States, right? So we're taking that outline, just looking within it and seeing the effects of inequality on, on things. But also, people said, oh, it's not just America, it's the English-speaking countries. Yeah. There's something weird about them. Take them away and it goes away. That's not true either. You can take all the English-speaking countries off and you've still got a relationship. And then some people go, it's the Scandinavian countries. <laughs> There's something weird about them. So with our index of health and social problems, we removed the English-speaking countries and the Scandinavian countries and Japan. We still find a correlation. But, but more important, there are now hundreds of analyses in the journals, and some of them include over 100 <coughs> countries. It isn't a matter of which you include. Um, but we wrote an additional chapter uh, answering the criticisms of that kind. Um, it was published in the English paperback uh, edition. I don't know whether it's in the American uh, edition. It's possible it is. Um, uh, so you can see whether there's a chapter yeah. answering critics. Um, but also, the Equality website has some of our replies yeah. to critics. The Equality Trust website yeah. has some of our but replies to critics. But basically, the world has moved on, right? And when this book came out, and reviewers were, were looking at it in the UK, nobody's criticising the science anymore. I think the world has moved on. Everybody accepts that inequality is damaging. What they said this time was, we're not quite sure that we like their solutions. To which I think we say, that's fine, you know, come up, come up with your own. Everybody's solutions are as valid as ours. Let's have that conversation now. Yeah. Should we stop there? Just wanted to give um, anyone who still wants to purchase a book a chance. Um, this is going to be the last call to go okay. downstairs to one of the registers and make a purchase. And I think it's probably a good note to end on as well. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.